Hey, lovelies. So excited to share the promo for Murderish Jamie's new podcast, Judgy and Juryish. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, I'm Jamie. You might know me from Murderish, a true crime podcast. Well, I've got a new podcast called Judgy and Juryish, and I'm hosting it with my best friend since junior high. That's me, Jesse. Every week on Judgy and Juryish, Jamie and I dish on our favorite reality TV shows, with Judgy opinions coming in hotter than a Lady Morgan toaster oven. We'll take you inside the drama, and when reality stars fight, best believe we are engaging. Put on your she by charade joggers, pour a glass of Ramona Pinot Grigio, then search for and subscribe to Judgy and Juryish in your favorite podcast app. And remember, Fix your face and stay looking hot. Because you don't want to end up with a crappy mug shot. Bye. Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 90 Troubling War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Miners. While you wait for the next episode, I wanted to share with you guys an interesting side story I came across while researching the last episode, Tough Love, that highlights other potential dangers that students living in behavioral rehabilitation schools have faced in the past. This episode does include explicit descriptions of abuse. Before attending Provo Canyon School, Paris Hilton had also attended a different school in Running Springs, California, in 1997 at 16 years old. That school, operated by a company called Sidu, started with the principles of Synanon in mind. Synanon was started by an Alcoholics Anonymous enthusiast in the late 1950s and the house used by adherents of the philosophy quickly overflowed with heroin addicts eager for a way to kick their junk habit. A foundation of Synanon was the game, a quasi-therapeutic approach to group therapy that centered on the verbal breaking down of participants and in time, the program became the go-to in the world of drug rehabilitation. The founder, Chuck Diedrich, became a swami of sorts and Synanon members eventually shaved their heads, wore matching clothes, and agreed to vasectomies and abortions at the behest of their leader. By the time Jim Jones murdered his followers at Jonestown in Guyana, Chuck Diedrich's time as a bona fide cult leader was coming to a close and he was arrested in 1978, eventually barred from dealing with the organization again. Synanon eventually folded in the early 1990s, however, its influence lived on, and the harsh and damaging behavior modification techniques carried out there for decades that don't even really work now widely permeated society. Defectors and proponents alike started new programs and companies using tactics learned there, with some focusing on wild teens, and youth boot camps and even faith-based gay conversion camps and weight loss camps began giving parents what was oftentimes false hope. Sidu was one of these Synanon-inspired offshoot companies and the drama just kept coming. It only takes a minute of searching about the topic online to find that the Sea-Do Running Springs campus even has a potential serial killer tied to its legacy. 
James Lee Crummel was born in 1944 and endured a messy childhood which included molestation by an older boy in his neighborhood and a mother who dressed him up as the daughter she'd always wanted. His loving parent, his father, had died when Crummel was 14 and his mother remarried to a man the teen hated so much he threw a cleaver at him. He was kicked out of the army and court-martialed by 18 for molesting three children and was sentenced to 10 years in military prison in Leavenworth, Kansas. Crummel served less than five years before being released at 24 years old. Tucson, Arizona was his next destination and he was now living with his partner, Steve. Nine-year-old Frank Clausen would be found not long after with his own belt secured tightly around his neck. And within a week, James Crummel and his boyfriend left for Wisconsin. Crummel talked as they drove, detailing how he was driven to kill the boy because he was afraid he would answer the searchers they could hear calling his name nearby. The pair settled in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where six months later, on August 29, 1967, Crummel sexually assaulted and beat a 14-year-old boy who survived. Crummel later told a psychologist in prison that he tried to kill the boy so he couldn't tell. Luckily, however, the boy did tell, and Crummel was arrested shortly after. When his partner Steve was questioned back then, he spilled the beans about Crummel murdering Frank Clausen in Arizona. Between 1968 and 1972, while in prison for the Milwaukee assault on the 14-year-old, prison psychiatric reports on Crummel said things such as, quote, He apparently cannot stop himself when he sees a young boy he's attracted to. It is further our opinion that he's dangerous. I suspect that he will have a great deal of difficulty in the community. This is one of the few people that we see who really fits the prototype of a cold-blooded killer. Though he'd been sentenced to an indefinite term, Crummel was released in August of 1972. Sometime between then and 1980, he met and began being treated by a psychiatrist named Dr. Bernard Forgey. Now using the state of California as his hunting ground, Crummel is thought to have murdered six-year-old Jeffrey Vargo in 1981. The boy's body was ultimately found over 20 miles away. Meanwhile, Pima County, Arizona investigators attempted to prosecute Crummel for the murder of Frank Clausen in Tucson, but his former partner Steve recanted his statements about the confession he'd received on their whirlwind drive up to Wisconsin. Crummel was arrested in May of 1982, but the charges were dropped. After going back to California, Crummel was beaten by Halloween partygoers after being found trying to molest the host's son. The Alpenhorn News reported that glitter from Crummel's face makeup was found on the boy's lower body. While in jail awaiting trial for that molestation, Pima County, Arizona police were able to arrest him again after a new law went into effect allowing his ex-partner's statements to police to be used in court even if the man wouldn't testify to it. Crummel received a life sentence in 1983 back in Arizona. However, he was granted a new trial based on ineffective assistance of counsel. In the ensuing years, valuable evidence had also been lost and a newly found hair was determined not to belong to Crummel. Allowed to take a deal and plead guilty to kidnapping, he served about one year in prison and returned to California a free man in late 1987. Crummel presumably returned to the company of Bernard Forgey, becoming the psychiatrist's paid assistant in 1990. That same year, Crummel called police to report that he'd stumbled across charred human remains while out hiking, after which he was allowed to go about his business. Dr. Forgey reportedly often had a male assistant living with him in the very same Newport Beach, California condo owned by Forgey's son, where Crummel now lived. All of these assistants were later discovered to have been sex offenders. That condo would become his downfall in 1997 
after police peppered the complex with flyers notifying the neighbors that Crummel, a registered sex offender, was living in their children's midst. Megan's law was new in Orange County, California, so members of the community were dealing with the novel and terrifying realization that sex offenders lived in their neighborhood. By 1997, cases against Crummel were being built by investigators in places he had moved from, leaving a trail of dead or battered boys in his wake. But the clincher had been a positive identification on the remains he had found. The deceased was found to be a boy who disappeared going to school 11 years before he was found, named James Wilford Trotter, age 13. Not only did police determine that Crummel had found Jamie's skull in 1990, but he had also lived on the same street as the boy in Costa Mesa, California, at the time he went missing in 1979, with police noting that the boy's daily path went right by the man's house. He also lived on the same street in Big Bear, California as a nine-year-old who disappeared in 1995 named Jack J.D. Phillips. While investigating all of these things, police realized that Crummel had been living with Dr. Forgey, who between 1990 and 1994 had been the contracted psychiatrist at Sea-Doo Running Springs Boarding School, as well as at the new alternative homes in Costa Mesa and Orange and other facilities in California that put his so-called assistant James Crummel, a high-level registered sex offender, in direct contact with young boys. Forgy also worked in private practice, plus he had a boat, presumably giving Crummel access to victims and a potential way of disposing of bodies. Both men were arrested after police determined a patient of Forgy's had been sexually assaulted in the Newport Beach condo on multiple occasions in late 1994 in the first half of 1995. Forgy confessed, lost his license to practice medicine, and was evicted from the condo by his son as police continued to investigate the pair's possible connection to missing boys at sea Running Springs. Forgy was found guilty of five felony counts of orally copulating a child in 1999 and died in a nursing home soon after. Crummel was also found guilty of those molestation charges and was imprisoned, and in 2004, he was handed the death penalty for the murder of Jamie Trotter. And while trying to negotiate that sentence away, he had offered to disclose the location of J.D. Phillips' body to no avail. Crummel hung himself in his cell in San Quentin in 2012 taking with him any information he had about J.D. Phillips and countless other possible victims peppered around the state and country, including two boys at sea Running Springs. Forgy himself had described giving Crummel full access to his patient's confidential medical files and leaving him unsupervised with minors at the facilities where he was acting as a psychiatrist. So police zeroed in on that detail and delved even deeper noting that whenever Forgy and Crummel came around sea Running Springs, a spike in, quote, runaways from the school would follow. Bill Gleason with the Department of Justice told Alpenhorn News in 2009 that two teens in particular were of interest in relation to Crummel. On January 16, 1993, 17-year-old John Christopher Inman disappeared from the sea campus and was considered one of their frequent runaways, even though he had left his vital seizure medication behind. The 6-foot-3, 200-pound teen also had a shunt implanted in his brain. Then, a year later, 14-year-old Blake Persley went missing as well after he went to a barn to check on the animals around 8 p.m. on June 26, 1994. According to the Resource Center for Cold Case Missing Children's Cases, his footprints were evidently tracked to a road and sightings of the boy sprung up for about a year. Blake's family, however, was skeptical that he would voluntarily leave as the teen knew there was nowhere to go, 
and had multiple medical issues that would have made traversing the terrain difficult, including a limp caused by the four-inch difference in the length of his legs and limited use of one arm. Blake, too, required seizure medications, which he did not have. And even with his medical 